Today I want to share something really personal with you. I want to share what it was like for me being in a coma, a medically induced coma, because it really made a huge impact on my life and I think I need to share the story with you and it might help you as well. Hi, I'm Amanda Vandergulik from CleverDoughKids.com and today I want to share with you my story about what it was like being in a coma, a medically induced coma. You see, three years ago, I got very sick. I ended up getting pneumonia that went into both lungs, so double lung pneumonia. And it started me on a journey through to dealing with being in a coma. And I want to share with you what that is like today. One of the things that I learned when going through the medicated coma was that life goes on without me. It may not sound like it's a great thing, but life goes on without us. And one of the really cool after effects that I didn't know until I looked months later, I actually earned money while in a coma. I mean, I literally earned money while I slept. I'll touch back on that in a little bit but the reason I want to tell you about that is because if you're new to my channel here and you don't know anything about Clever Dough Kids, I help entrepreneurs learn success and healthy wealth principles and learn also how to teach those to your children. So if that sounds like something that you would be interested in, then make sure you subscribe and click that notification bell so that you'll know the minute my next video comes out. Today, I want to talk to you about being in a coma and what it was like for myself, my family, my children, everyone around us. So what happened? Well, it was already about three and a half years ago and we were going through a very stressful time and I was stressed about so many things. I'd gone through a divorce, I'd moved in with a new partner, I was letting my children go to school for the first time after having homeschooled them for over 12 years and I was dealing with a lot of stress. On top of that we were also doing a musical. We were in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang which was wonderful except that on our dress rehearsal I fell through the stage and I hit my chest really hard against the speaker and then I got sick. Again, I was crazy busy, I was crazy stressed, and I wasn't thinking about it. My daughter got sick, and I was spending all my nights helping her cope with, with dealing with the cold that she was dealing with, and I was absolutely run down. We went to the hospital after first going to my doctor and asking for some antibiotics. And my doctor was kind of shocked that I wanted antibiotics because I never want any kind of medication. I love just going all natural whenever I can. Try everything but medicine first and then take medicine if necessary. But I was begging him to please give me some antibiotics because I knew something was going on in my body that I wasn't able to handle myself. I knew it. So he got out his stethoscope and he had a listen and he couldn't hear anything and I never thought about it and, and he never thought about it but I didn't lay down during the examination and it was when I was laying down that the fluid would build up when I was sitting up it would run away and so he didn't hear the fluid and he didn't know I had pneumonia and I didn't know but I knew something was up and he said I don't think antibiotics are gonna help with this. It's just a cold, just rest, you know, vitamin C. And I'm like, please give me the antibiotics. So he did, he wrote out a prescription, I said, all right, well, try this. Well, a couple of days went past and I just got worse and worse. And I finally, I said to my partner, look, I've got to go to ER, I, I can't handle this, I need help. So she brought me to ER and we patiently waited, as it always takes a while, and I was struggling, but I thought I can do this. And we got in there, and I was so completely worn out, and I asked if I could be put on the IV. I just, I felt I needed help, 
and the doctors looked at me and said, yeah, we can do that. They rolled me down to the x-rays first to, to check my lungs out. Standard procedures to see if you have pneumonia. And it came back positive. I had pneumonia in my, in my left lung or my right lung, I don't know. My oxygen levels were so depleted that I don't really remember. But it was in one of the lungs and they put me on the IV. I depleted, I depleted that bag and I was like, I need more. They gave me one more bag and then they sent me home and they said, just finish the antibiotics that you're on and we'll see how that goes. But it got worse. It got to the point where I could barely move. Well, about two days later, I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't cope any longer. I had reached the limit of being able to survive. But I knew I did not have the strength to sit in ER and wait for them to call my turn. I would have just simply collapsed. And so my partner called our national health line to ask for advice. And after about half an hour of talking with her on the phone and understanding what my what I was going through, what my symptoms were, how I was feeling, she suggested I go to ER and she assured me I would not have to wait. And she was correct. We got there, they took one look at me and they just immediately called me into one of the medication, the examination rooms. They rolled me down to the x-ray, took another x-ray, it had spread. Both of my lungs were completely full of pneumonia. The antibiotics had done nothing. My oxygen was falling. I was put on another IV and I was rolled upstairs and checked into the hospital. The next two days, I have no recollection. My oxygen levels were so low that my brain cells were not able to store memories. I have no recollection of the time at all, which is probably best. My oxygen plummeted below 80 which is very, very scary and very life-threatening. And our home local hospital didn't have an ICU. So I had to be shipped to the nearest hospital with an ICU. And I was very lucky because it could have been anywhere in the province. And luckily they found one bed 45 minutes away. But in order to do so, they had to medically induce me into a coma, paralyze me and into intubinate me and apparently again I don't have any recollection but I can totally see myself saying this when the doctors and the nurses told me what we had to do in order to get me to the hospital that I needed to get to so that I could survive I said yeah sleep would be great so it's kind of nice to know I guess that even in my darkest moments I have a sense of humor so that was kind of cool and they told my partner that it would just be for a couple of days, just enough time to get me down safely, stabilize me, and then they would take me off the medication and I could slowly heal. And that was the expectation going into it. But when I got there, I didn't stabilize. I got worse. And I developed what's known as ARDS, which is Acute Respiratory um, Distress Syndrome. syndrome. And what it really means is that my lungs gave up. They were no longer able to function on their own. And I had to be continuously intubated and oxygen pumped into my lungs to keep me alive. My partner, bless her heart, when she heard the word, she Googled ARDS and it was not a good sight. It was very grim. The survival rates ranged between 20 to 40% and more on the lower end. So it was not a happy sight for her to see. And I can only imagine the panic, all of that panic, all of that fear. So the induced coma ended up lasting for three weeks before I finally came back. They had a bed ready for me at the Toronto hospital that specializes in respiratory care. And the doctors were ready to send me down but they just proned me one last time. To be proned means that you get flipped upside down, which then opens up the lungs so that your lungs can expand greater and potentially allow more oxygen into my body. It takes a huge team of about seven or eight people to actually turn a 
completely comatose person upside down, keeping all the lines in. I had so many tubes and lines going through me. One of the lovely side effects is you get tons of lesions on your body because they have to put little gel pads to kind of balance you out and your skin can't breathe. So I had lovely welts and blisters and scars, but that's okay. I mean, when you get your life back, who cares about a couple of scars, right? Anyway, it worked. My lungs finally started to cooperate and come back. So that's what the medically induced coma was like from a medical perspective. Of course, there are a lot of emotional sides to it and there are the dreams. I have the craziest, scariest nightmares of my life. It was awful. It was something nobody should ever have to go through. And it was just nightmares. It, they call it ICU psychosis. But it's so real. It's almost more real than reality. Every experience in my life that meant something to me, every fear I'd ever had, every manipulation that had ever happened to me, they all got mixed together and they became this horrible nightmare horror story. It's like I lived a second life and the memories are so strong. They're stronger than normal, regular life memories that I have and they were so clear, they're still clear, they have not gone away. They've lessened over time. The impact of them has lessened over time, thank goodness. But the memories are there as if I'd actually experienced them. They actually brought me out of the coma for a couple of hours on Valentine's Day. And it was supposed to be this wonderful opportunity for her to reconnect with her loved one on such a special day but it brought me only to slightly awake and in that paranoid state and I was absolutely beside myself and my body couldn't handle the terror and so they had to induce me again immediately. My children luckily were kept away from the hospital. I had friends of mine who are mediums and who don't know each other tell me the same stories that they connected with my spirit and that I was at the end of my bed looking at my body and that they were like, come on, you gotta come back. And I was like, no, there's, there's too much stress. I, I can't handle the stress. And they're like, no, but you have to come back. Your children need you. And it was that your children need you that triggered me. I had to come back for my children. But the fact that I had multiple friends tell me the same story who had never met each other and they didn't hear each other, really makes you question you know, what is reality? What is out there? One of the benefits of being in a coma, the ICU psychosis, the crazy nightmare dreams, was actually that I now have a really deep understanding of what it's like someone who goes through mental health issues and sees something that is not there because for them, it is there. It is absolutely real to them. And so when I was told in my psychosis, oh, don't worry, those things aren't there, it made me panic more. These people that I loved did not see the dangers around them and it made me panic more. It did not make me feel better. Time was just for them to hold my hand and say, I know you're right and I'm here, I promise I'll stay here. We'll get through this, we can do this rather than telling me that what I saw was not real because that confused me because to me it was real and it just made me panic that they weren't aware of the dangers around them. There are a couple of other things that were very interesting like my it takes a while for them to figure out how many medications to give, what amounts of which and what. I blew up like a puffer fish. I, look at my hand, it looks like a baby, a newborn baby's puffed up hand. And then by the end of the coma, when they finally took me out of it, I dropped like 40 pounds. Yes, you know, best diet ever, except it all came back afterwards because, well, when you're recovering from a serious illness like this, you don't move a lot. And when you don't move a lot, you don't keep weight off very well either. <laughs> so I'm still working on that one. I had a battle and I won <laughs> so I don't mind those but it got so bad that they were 
preparing a hospital downtown in Toronto to receive me and to do a lung bypass. They were going to completely pull all of the blood out of my lungs and put fresh blood in. And it's a very scary procedure and it comes with risks. And I was this close to having that happen, but my lungs started to come back. They started to breathe on their own. They started to get stronger. My stats started to change. My oxygen levels started to finally, finally come back. Like, what a miracle. I was absolutely just static for so long. No disimprovement, no improvement. I developed ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which I believe I mentioned again, one of the lovely side effects is memory loss. Very handy especially if you forget to, you know, clean the dishes. It was a huge impact on my family. All I know is that I'm incredibly grateful for this experience. I don't wish it upon anybody. It's taken an incredibly long time to overcome it. I'm still not 100%. I struggle daily from it, but what it's like to be an ARDS survivor and what you have to cope with on a daily basis. As you can hear, my lungs are starting to get tired. Thank you for listening. I hope you found this interesting. And this video is in support of a fabulous lady who passed away a year ago, Claire Weinland, whose documentary is coming out in September and who I highly recommend you look into. This is a girl who suffered from cystic fibrosis her whole entire life. And when she was 13 years old, she ended up in a coma, just like I did. But when she woke up from her two week she had this wonderful inspiration to create a foundation to support cystic fibrosis families with the support, emotional and financial support that they need, that they weren't able and they weren't getting. She had the most amazing model to live a life you are proud of. So check out the links below. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you'll know when my next video comes out and take a look at my coma playlist where I'll go through with you the, the dreams, the recovery, and so much more. Thank you.